An evolving system increases its work, sorry, increases its complexity unless work is done to reduce it. This was a observation made by Meyer Lehman over 30 years ago. I think anyone sat here today who has worked with legacy code knows the truth of this statement viscerally. One of the ways that I find this complexity manifests most commonly is through the introduction of global state into a code base. Global state is very easy to add to your code, but removing it can be a real challenge. It reduces what you can do with your code. It makes your code harder to understand. It pretty much stops you from testing your code entirely, or at least certainly some kinds of code. Today, I want to talk to you about the struggles we've had with global state in our code and the way that we are trying to excise that global state from our code base and potentially a technique that you could apply to your own code if you need to try and modernize it yourself. My name is Sean Marshall say and welcome to my talk, The Global Revolt. And can I just congratulate our chair on being able to pronounce my surname right? Because many people can't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so to introduce myself a little bit more, and if I wander away from the mic and you stop being able to hear me, please shout. Um, I am a PhD student at Queen's Belfast. I work in atomic physics. I have a background academically in physics, but I've also got a background industrially in software engineering. Um, I've worked on legacy technical codes in industry, and I've also worked as uh, a senior data scientist in the past. And one of the things I'm doing as part of my PhD, among other things, is trying to improve the way we use and write software in computational physics and potentially computational science in general. Uh, and the kind of test bed for a lot of that will be the RMT code base, um, which is the code that my group writes, develops, and uses. But what is RMT? Well, the simplest way to answer that question is to say it's the R matrix with time dependence code, a simulation of atomic physics. But I don't think many of you are atomic physicists. So you might be more interested to know that it's a continuously developed piece of research software. It's not a piece of software that was written and stayed static. We just last year supposedly finished two major projects, one to add more features and one to add kind of a uh, better scaling. I say supposedly, and I will get back to that in a second. Um, a bit more pertinently to this track, it's a legacy Fortran 90 code base. It started life in 2011 and different people will have different opinions on whether a 10 year old code can be legacy. But when I say it started life, what I mean was we took two 20 year old code bases and stapled them together. Uh, so really its lineage dates back at least 30 years. Um, it's a program with two regression tests and no unit tests, or at least was before I started my work. It's a HPC code. So testing it comprehensively with regression tests is nigh impossible. Um, and because of our global state problem, we have not been able to create a unit test, a set of unit tests for it. Um, it has, however, been experimentally validated a lot. You know, it's not that the code is wrong, but changing it is dangerous. We have no real way to say whether we've broken it or not. And most pertinently for this talk, it's a code base with almost 500 global mutable variables in it. Depending on how you count lines of code, that's somewhere between 1% and 3% of the code base solely dedicated to declaring global mutable variables. It's a lot. And it makes working with this code very difficult. So how has that actually affected us? Well, for one, onboarding time nowadays is ridiculous. It will take people months before they can even make minor changes to the code. It will take years before they can have any real sense of being able to work on the code properly. And arguably, the people who wrote this code don't even know what it does anymore. It's difficult. I mentioned earlier that we had supposedly finished two projects last year. 
Um, and that was, in fact, about 12 months ago, not just last year. We still haven't been able to merge those two changes into our main feature branch because we're still trying to find bugs in them. And these are two major pieces of functionality. Merging them is not going to be fun. So all of our feature development, it's dominated by bug hunting. But also localized changes to small parts of the code base often cause us to have to change the rest of the code. It makes small changes into big and dangerous changes. I've said multiple times already, it makes the code difficult to test. Because we did at one point try setting up unit tests in with all this global state and we couldn't do it. We just could not do it. We spent months trying and it just didn't work. And it prevents us from fixing other parts of the code. You know, this lack of tests is a big thing. It stops you from making big changes because they're so difficult to do. And it causes this kind of vicious cycle, right? So you can identify that you've got problems with global state, okay? If you want to start to fix those problems, you have to refactor. But if you try to refactor without a good set of comprehensive tests, then it's dangerous. You don't know if your changes are right. You don't know if you've broken something. You don't know if you've changed your outputs. And that's largely because you can't write fair tests because of all this global state. It's a big vicious cycle. And so I want to spend the rest of this talk talking you through a technique that I have called about 20 different things. Currently, I'm calling it the shielding technique. That will probably change tomorrow. We'll see. Um, but this is, you know, it's nothing fancy. It's just the process that we've taken to try and break this cycle. A process we've taken to try and start to make changes in this code base where making changes is horrific. Um, before I talk to you about what it is or how you do it, I just want to cover why we did this in particular. Because I think it's a, a few unique challenges, or maybe not so unique. <laughs> um, for one thing, I think we needed something that was incremental. Now, I've actually, since writing this, regretted saying 12 months because it kind of implies that you could sort this code base out in 12 months, and that is not true. 12 years, maybe, we'll see. But, you know, we are a research team. If we want to sit down and completely change this code base, then that's a person who can't do research for several years. And that's just not something you can sell. It's not something you can do as a research team. Whereas having one person sit down for a month with no research output, it's a bit more pal palatable. As I said before, we are still adding features to RMT. It's not even close to the limit of what it can do scientifically. We just need to add the features. Um, and largely our research output is based on the new features we add. So we needed something that could go hand in hand with adding new features. Um, and again, it's a scientific code. We don't want to be publishing wrong answers. We needed something that we could do that minimized the risk of us breaking things. So how do we have we do this? It's actually a, a, a very simple method. And that there's some complexity hidden in there. And a lot of people don't really think of doing things this way. Um, your first step, unsurprisingly, find a function to refactor. There are many ways of doing this. Um, for our work, I like to look at functions where they're not calling many other functions. And I'll show you in a second exactly what I mean by that. And that will become a bit clearer. Once you've identified a function, shield it from the rest of the rest of the code base. So as we uh, saw on our last slide, we want to A, be able to develop alongside refactoring. 
but we also want to minimize risk and minimizing risk means minimizing the amount of changes you actually have to make, certainly in logic. So shield the functions interface from the rest of the code base. And it means that any functions that talk to the function you're refactoring don't need to change if you change that function's interface. Um, but importantly, we do this step without making any logic changes. Again, minimize risk, minimize changes to logic. There are no tests at this point. Therefore, try not to break anything. And once you've shielded the interface, you can localize the state access by that function. Um, a lot of people forget that the global state you use in a function is part of your function's interface. It's take that away and other functions are going to break. Um, and once you've localized state, you can comprehensively unit test more effectively. Um, as I say, we tried unit testing without getting in a global state and it just didn't work. Got rid of our global state and it was a lot easier. It's not easy, especially in HPC code, but it's easier, it's doable. It's something you can actually make tracks in. Then you can refactor that function in other ways, if it's appropriate. You might find it's not appropriate. You might find you need to refactor two functions before you can do some extra refactoring. You might find you need to get rid of the global state in an entire module before you can make any meaningful refactors. But if it's appropriate for just one, your one function, go for it. But if it's not appropriate, repeat. Do this to more functions get more functions into a state where they can be unit tested, and then you can start to refactor to your heart's content, because now you can make changes and be not sure you're not breaking anything, but at least confident that there is some semblance of correctness going on there. Certainly more confident than you were before. But it's this step six that hides a lot of the comp complexity. And so I want to take you through a an example. And I want to take you through an example on a quite a high level. So the details of exactly how this happens in the code isn't that important or rather would take me hours to explain. Um, I do have a repository where I have essentially applied this process to this code that you can see here. That has commits and commit messages that can explain the process a bit more in detail. But I want to go over it and you will get to see that link again later, don't worry. Um, but I want to go over it on a much higher level. I want to go over it on a much smaller part of the code because the 15 or 16 functions there, it's, it's, it's a lot to take in. So we are instead going to look at this much smaller piece of code here. So come to, <laughs> come to this code, you find it's full of global state and you can't do any testing on it. You decide, need to refactor one of these functions. You need to get rid of the global state in one of these functions. What do you pick? I said earlier that I like to try and pick functions that don't have, don't call many other functions. So for example, sorry, I just pointed at my screen and none of you can see that. Um, <laughs> this new mob call is single function on the right. This is a good candidate. It doesn't call any other functions. It's not really gonna be much complexity there. So we choose that as our first step in our refactoring. And so the first step is to shield it. Now I've very imaginatively given it a, uh, a suffix of underscore S to stand for shielded. Um, but what we've done here in reality is we've taken any logic out of numeral of Cooley single and put it into numeral of Cooley single S. And our numeral of Cooley single S is only called by numeral of Cooley single. Sorry, these names are gonna get really confusing, aren't they? Um, but what this means is that numeral call single S is shielded from the rest of the code base. We can make changes to its fun, its interface without breaking anything. Um, and so that's what we do. We can remove any references to global state from that function. And because it's only called by this numeral call single function, that's the only place we need to make any changes in the rest of the code. And you can see I've split this code up into three different sections. Um, this, this isn't anything more than just a guide for how you can think about the cool graph in this program. The adapter boundary is here just to say, 
here is a function responsible for maintaining the old interface to the rest of the code. You know, it creates a boundary around your new code just to stop changes to the interface spreading throughout the rest of your code. And that's it. That, that's, that's how you do one function. How do we then do more? Um, it would be obvious to do the uh, new of Cooley function at this point, because that only calls functions that already have a local version. Um, but to illustrate some of the ways to think about this, I'm actually going to do the new of search function because it's more because it's more complex, and I can illustrate that to you. So again, we do exactly the same thing. We extract any logic out of it which doesn't itself call other functions or rather other functions that are using global state. And this is because if you also extracted calls to those functions, then you're shielded, your local only using numer of call ES, numer of search S, sorry, would call a function which is using global state and would therefore be using global state. So we need to segment the numer of search, uh, numer of search function into two or three or four. It depends on the details and you can apply this as broadly or as kind of specifically as you want. Um, and in that repo that I posted earlier, you will see an exact example of this. And again, you do the same thing. You localize any state access in that function and you bring this new of search function into the adapter boundary. But you can see that it still has to call, again, I pointed to my screen, I apologize. You can see that it still has to call back into the global using code, it still has to call back into this new of Cooley function, but that's fine. Functions in your adapter boundary, they are, it's what they're there for. They're there to shield off any global using code. But it does mean that the next target of our localization of state probably wants to be our new of Cooley function. And that's what we do. It's also worth pointing out that even though we've brought new of Cooley single into our adapter boundary, we still haven't changed new of search s to use it. Again, that's because it's still using global code because it's calling into this new of Cooley function. But if we apply this uh, process to new of Cooley, we can now bring that into our local only code and our new of search s function can start to use it. Now I've I've given you an intermediate step here before we've changed new of search s. So the new of search adapter function is still calling the new of Cooley adapter function, despite the fact new of Cooley s exists. Um, again, in that repo I posted earlier, I explain why, and it's so that we can make sure that all of these local using functions are all unit tested, and you don't have any step in your code where you're making changes without them being unit tested. But now that Numa of Call ES exists, we can call it from Numa of Search S. And there's not actually anything new in the rest of the code. Or sorry, there's not anything new in applying this process to the rest of the code. Again, you can shield and localize the Hartree method. You can shield and localize main. And what you end up with is a code which is entirely used in local state, it's entirely unit tested and is much more amenable to refactoring, to improving without risk of breaking or rather while well, minimizing risk of breaking anything. So I'm just gonna put that link again, just for a second for anyone missed it earlier. And with this technique, I've talked a lot about global state. And anyone who read the um, audience section of the abstract for this talk will notice I did say it can be used even in other situations. It's not purely about removing global state. You can use this for other reasons. Some of those reasons are, and in fact, some of those reasons, all of these reasons have applied to our code base. But it can break out of this vicious cycle of global state. But even if you don't have global state, even if you're struggling to add 
unit tests into your code for other reasons, you can use this kind of process to slowly refactor your code in such a way you can add unit tests, such that you can then refactor more thoroughly. And it also allows you, because you've got this idea of shielding your code under refactor from the rest of your code, you can also use it to perform large-scale refactors without having to stop ongoing development. Um, I've given some useful links here. Uh, the top one is, again, the third link to that same repository. Um, the link after that is a very much in progress paper at the moment that we're, we're writing to explain this more thoroughly. Uh, and the final link is RMT. This is the code that I was talking about earlier. It's the simulation code that we work on. Um, and this was the code that first spawned this idea. It's the code that we had to do this to in order to try and not have a horrendous time developing. Uh, thank you for listening. And do we have any questions? Okay, so the first question, was consideration given to getting funding to do a full code rewrite rather than refactoring the code? So I knew this question was going to come up because obviously that is the question everyone's going to ask. I could fill an entire presentation about why we didn't do a full rewrite. Um, I've seen full rewrites work and I have seen many more full rewrites fail. My personal expectation, and potentially if you get through these questions quickly, I can go more into this, was that a full rewrite of RMT would be highly risky in that we would risk not being able to fully reproduce the outputs that we were previously getting. I don't think that would have worked. I think it would have been a constant kind of catch up, trying to catch up to the new features we were adding to RMT. Um, and fundamentally, I think it would have taken a long time. I don't think it's the kind of thing you could get, even a year's worth of funding. I did say that 12 months I was being very optimistic in that earlier slide. I think that would have been a three, four, maybe even five year undertaking. And I just don't think that's the thing we could have been funded for. Um, and I am very happy to talk more about that later if we get through these questions quickly. Um, so we considered it, and I just don't think it was a sensible thing to do. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, no, that's fine. I will come stand here. <laughs> okay, next question. For your problem, was the global state localized in a single class module structure, or was the global state distributed across or stored in different classes, modules, structures? How would these scenarios affect your approach? Very good question, actually. Um, so first of all, I should probably point out, this is a, a procedural code base. So it's modules and functions rather than classes. Um, and no, the global state was spread across everything. Um, I think there is one module in there that has about 80 global variables, and the rest of them are just spread across the other kind of 20 modules or however many you've got. Um, I think to some extent, I don't think it really matters to what extent the global state is localized. I think when, unless you're encapsulating it, in which case potentially there is different ways you would go about getting rid of it then, or maybe it, it becomes livable. Um, but for us, it was spread across the code base. For us, I think even if it was all in one module, then fundamentally it's being used across the code base. And so exactly where it's declared doesn't make a difference. Uh, if we were able to encapsulate it, then I don't see a pathway to that being helpful, but potentially there is something you could do there, yes. Okay, we've got a comment. Um, very cool refactoring technique. Um, and then number two, the book Dealing Effectively with Legacy Code has helped me a lot throughout the years with refactoring strategies. So I mean, no question there. If you want to comment. A, a very quick comment. 
this book has been on my to read list for about three years and I just have never got around to reading it. Um, yeah, I, I, I have heard very good things about this book and I would strongly recommend, um, I say three years, I have no idea how long it's been on my to read list. I've definitely come across it before and have not had the time to read it yet. Um, but yes, I've heard very good things. Have the scientists who work with the code embraced this refactoring? Did you need to spend lots of time to get them on board? So it's, I to an extent came into this code base with a slightly easier job. Um, my RPI, the person who kind of leads our team is very on board with research software engineering. He's very on board with trying to get this code into a much more usable state. Um, so I certainly didn't need to spend much time getting the main people in this team on board. But yes, there are definitely people on this team who see this as busy work or not useful work. And ironically, these are the people who would probably benefit most from it. Um, and I don't have a good answer to essentially how you persuade people of that. Um, but for me, just going ahead and doing it anyway and hoping that in time they see the benefits has been my strategy. Thank you. Uh, Laura has asked, what is the user experience of this code like? What considerations will be made when your refactor hits the user interface? Um, terrible. <laughs> Essentially, the users of this code are my team, okay? <laughs> We have lots of collaborators who have tried to use this code and have opened issues on our GitLab repository or emailed us and gone, uh, we can't use your code. And we have then essentially had to go and run it for them. Um, the user experience is terrible. And one of the things that I hope this refactor will enable is work towards a better user interface that prevents people from essentially having to come via us to use the code. And of course, there are some interesting political considerations there in that in academia, being a collaborator is a lot more of a big deal than being a citation. That's if your code gets cited at all. Um, so there are definitely some people who are less enthusiastic about making this code easier to use because it means that they will no longer get to be collaborators. Um, but personally, and true for RPI as well, I'm a big believer in open science. I'm a big believer that code shouldn't be, or rather code should be easy to use, that code should be easy to share and spread. Um, I'm much more interested in being the developer of a widely used code than I am being a collaborator on hundreds of papers. Um, yeah, that would. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, that jumped. How much of state was actually used in one function typically? Did you get to local functions with 20 arguments then? Another great question, actually, because I kind of hinted at it in the talk and never really explicitly stated it. But yes, you get local functions using more than 20 arguments. But in the wake of this localization of state, what we are hoping to do is improve the way that our data is structured, okay? So to give an example, um, without getting too much into the atomic physics of things, the code essentially runs on a set of symmetry blocks. Each of those symmetry blocks has an eigenfunction. When we create this data, what we do is we put all of those eigenfunctions into a big matrix where the column is your symmetry block and the row is the kind of index of your eigenfunction. But not all of these eigenfunctions are the same length. Some of them tail to zero much more quickly. And so for performance reasons, you cut them off, which means that for our eigenfunctions, instead of having one array of 20 eigenfunctions, what we have is a 20 by 200 matrix of eigenfunctions, and then another vector which tells us how many uh, elements are in each of these columns. Um, and so a big 
part of the reason why we have 429 global mutual variables is because we have so much extra information that needs to be manually handled when having better structure to our data would significantly reduce the amount of data we need to store and change. Um, so yes, we do, but in the wake of this refactoring, there will be more refactoring to improve that problem, which we can now do because everything's unit tested. Okay, we're going to do one more question, I think. Uh, so we've got great talk. Still not sure why not start the process with adding some light regression tests for the function you're shielding? Could you elaborate? Yes. So um, it's worth talking a little bit about how, well, I say talk a little bit. This is obviously a HPC code and comprehensively regression testing the entire code is not really doable because it essentially involves running hundreds of calculations and when each of these calculations can take one or two days, you don't have the time to do that because you can't afford it. Um, so regression testing the full code base is not really viable. Now, the problem is with individual functions and trying to regression test those. And I will put my hands up low and say, I've been talking unit testing here. I say unit testing to refer to kind of individual units of the code. And I do think a lot of the unit tests we added ended up being regression tests in reality. Um, and so the only reason we don't do that before shielding the function is because it requires us to set up a lot of data in ways that are not necessarily obvious without just running all of the code up to that point, um, which again, you can't really do because it requires a lot of computational time. Um, so if you can, do, but we couldn't. Um, 